Representative Alexander, I'd like to thank you for your service to the people of Texas. I understand we're here in Beeville in your office today. I understand that you've been a county attorney, county judge, served on the Texas Parole Board, I believe, and were freshman of the year last year in the Texas legislature. And uh, so you have a strong history of service to the people of Texas, and we greatly appreciate that. And today we're here to talk about the Delegars, and thank you for your hospitality here and, and welcoming us to Beeville and the, the newly formed 34th Congressional District. It's exciting that we have this new representation here in Texas. I wonder yes. if you could tell us a little bit about this part of the district and I understand you've endorsed uh, Ms. Carson. Yes, I've endorsed uh, Adela. Uh, I did several months ago. I thought she was the best candidate of the three that are running, mainly because uh, I believe she's the most qualified. She's a conservative. She's been a Republican for a long time. Uh, she's currently serving on the College Board of Trustees in, in um, the Valley, and we need people that are experienced, that know how to move around in government, and I think she's she's the one. The other two candidates don't have her experience and, and qualifications, so that's why I endorsed her. But as far as the district, the, the part that I represent uh, is about three or four counties in her new district, mm -hmm. um, and they're rural. Uh, South Texas districts, and they have a different uh, demographic than where she's from, which is the valley. But the weight of the population for the district is in the valley. So I'm hoping that with her and with me having some contact with her, that she'll understand that we up here in the north exist and, and we're not going to be neglected, as we have been with our current representation with uh, Congressman Hinojosa. And Congressman Hinojosa is from down in the valley. He's from uh, the Hidalgo County area, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. And the district, I believe, runs from just north of here, north and west of here. Actually, almost to San Antonio, you know, Gonzales County, okay. part of Gonzales County, all the way down to the valley. I, I don't know how many miles that is, but it's, it's a long, here in the north we call those fajita strip districts. <laughs> <laughs> because if you look at a map, they're all stretched from the south to the north. And it was in order to comply with the Voting Rights Act that, that the districts had to be formed that way. I grew up in Rockport, not very far from here, and I understand how those long districts, and, and the smaller part of the district like this can end up being underrepresented because of the weight of the population in the other part. In, in Rockport, we ended up being represented by somebody from Houston or Galveston mm -hmm. most of the time instead of what would have been more logical, Corpus Christi. But uh, About three-fifths of the, of the population for this district lives in the valley. Mm -hmm. So yes, and, and it's a, and the de valley is a completely de different demographic than, than the northern end of the district. So what is the district like up in, in this part of the state? It has been, it has proven to be so so different than, than 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 the valley because it's so spread out. Uh, we're used to block walking at, at home, and, and it is so difficult to to get a group of people to block walk anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has been difficult to bring them all together because it is so different than the valley. And and, and I and, and they're so eager to have to be represented by, by somebody. But also this is the first time they feel that, that they have a say so and they're being very careful who they choose uh, to represent them. And I, I, I don't blame it. I feel the same way. We were not the majority uh, when we were represented by our former uh, congressman. And, and, and you kind of want to have that open door, and uh, it didn't happen, and, and I understand. Tell us a little bit, uh, the readers of Texas GOP Vote, a little bit about your background and, and why you want to be the congressperson representing this district. I understand you work with uh, Blake Parenthal as well. I, I have lived in my district for 36 years, and I started serving about 30 years ago. Uh, and you start with the school board and then the irrigation district and, and, and you move on like that. You learn how to work with people and, and how to work with government agencies and, and it's a progression. And when I worked for, for Congressman Brantall and I came to work for him because I, I helped him in his campaign, I led the effort to change our congressman because we were tired of being underrepresented. And we chose Congressman Brenthal because he won the, the primary. Uh, I didn't know him. Uh, he, he 
came and asked for help, and, and, and we agreed. Uh, Mr. David Colina and I decided we were going to change our congressman, and we were very lucky. We did. That and, was an amazing victory because yeah. the, the incumbent had been in office. 28 years. Yeah, forever. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody thought we were crazy, yeah. and, 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 and we kept hearing it. You guys are crazy. Uh, but we knew that if we continued, if we just worked really, really hard, we could make a difference. And when that happened, Congressman Franthal said, well, you know, would you like to work for me? And I've been kind of semi-retired. Uh, I just run my business. But I thought it was a wonderful opportunity for me to represent my people and uh, my district. And I, and I did that. And, and it was a very, very rewarding experience. And, and I one that I don't regret at all. My only regret was that I had to step down to run for this position. Now, one of the things that the courts argued in our drawn out primary system here caused by the chaos with the courts in, in San Antonio was that Republicans couldn't elect a Hispanic to represent a Hispanic district. But clearly, you're, you're here and you're a front runner in this race and, and you do a great job of representing the people of the district. One of the things I found in my business dealings with people in the Valley is there really is a conservative base down there. They may wear a Democrat label, but they really are conservative people in their values and in their culture. You know, I found out because I've run nonpartisan races and I have been elected by Democrats and Republicans. And I think that's the advantage that I have in this race, that you have to have a very broad base in Cameron County. And I have that. Uh, my last election for uh, the trustee for the community college, I, I got over 3,000 votes. Uh, and that was one third of the county, three school districts. So I have crossover vote. And I think that is the advantage that I have. Other than being a small business owner, then uh, my house is in order, I'm financially stable, my, my kids have graduated, uh, I don't have little ones in the house. And, and being a congressperson, it's a difficult job. I saw it with my former <coughs> boss. I mean, he didn't call home um, maybe twice a, 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 a month. But maybe if he slept at home twice a month, it was a lot. So it takes a lot of commitment. And you have to really pretty much be free of a job and <coughs> kids and your family. And so uh, I, I think that's, that's the advantage that I have, too. Last session, when you were in the State House, the Republican Hispanic Conference pushed a, a, a proposal through called HCR 88 about immigration reform and border security. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and maybe get your reaction to um, what that premise on the national level? Well, I think that came out of a frustration that uh, our immigration system seems broken. Uh, you know, there's a, a for example, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country. I waited in line to come to this country to become a citizen. I did. I, I came at the age of four. I came as a legal resident, came over legally, and I waited till I was 17 to become a citizen. Mm -hmm. And it seems like those that are uh, following the rules uh, are getting pushed to the back of the line, which isn't the way things are supposed to work. Uh, the other frustration is is that. Uh, the, the federal government is not doing anything about securing our borders. And that's, that's a frustration for the entire country because they feel, and I, and I think John McCain was right on this issue, and that is, close the border, let's see who's here, and let's see what we can do, uh, humanely. And that was part of HCR 88. One of the other things we helped push was a, uh, was, was a, I would call it the Dream Act, the Military Dream Act, and that is, is if, if individuals that have lived in this country uh, as young youngsters were brought over uh, unbeknownst or or with you know because their parents brought them over right. uh, they've assimilated and they want to join the military and serve uh, honorably for a, a few years then then they should be looked at for citizenship and we have kind of had a similar program with Filipinos uh, that were able to to join the military serve and then become US citizens so I, I you know, personally, I think that's a better dream act than what the Democrats propose, which is you go to college, which is not a hardship by any means, especially when you're going on the, on the taxpayer dollar and somehow making 
that's that the equivalent of military service. I, I've served in the military. I did four and a half years in the, in, in the actually five years in the United States Navy. So I, I know what a hardship military service is. I noticed a picture in the reception area yeah. of your office. Of, is that your son with General That, that was my uh, son, and he, he served honorably, and so did I have another boy in Korea right now. And that was my son's reenlistment with uh, General Petraeus. I've tried to push my children into the military. I think it's a great start for anybody. It is a great way to, to learn and find out a little bit about who you are. As a congresswoman, how would you address the issue of border security and immigration reform? I think there are two separate issues. I think we need to secure the borders first. And, and I believe we need boots on the ground. We need, we need to secure our borders before we even start talking about immigration because they're, they're different things. And, and I live in the valley. I, I know, no matter how much they tell us our borders are secure, they are not. Uh, I have some property and, and, and I have a shed and, and frequently we have to change the doors and the windows because uh, illegal aliens come and, 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 and occupy your, your property and destroy your property. And uh, as long as we, our borders are not secure, we're going to continue to have that problem. I, as I feel for the ranchers that their, their fences are broken and, and sometimes cattle is killed for, for one meal. I understand that it used to be where when they came across they didn't do damage to the fences and that kind of thing, but recently that has escalated and it's almost malicious in, in the effort to turn the cattle loose on the road to distract law enforcement so that they can work the smuggling on through there. Well, there's, there's more than just human smuggling. You're having so many things come across the border, drugs, uh, prostitution, it's, it's, it's lawlessness and, and you know the, the federal government in Washington just turns the other way and, and I think they do that on purpose because I think they want to overwhelm the system to the point that, that uh, you know Americans just throw up their hands in frustration and, and accept whatever and, and uh, to a certain extent I think it's worked we kind of become jaded. It'd be nice if we could get Secretary Napolitano to come down and spend a couple weeks on a ranch in, in South Texas and let her sleep in a tent like on a ranch and, <laughs> and see if she isn't scared to death. <laughs> and you know, when we, when we build a border, there, there's land on the other side. When we build a fence, there's land on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, the people that live on this side of the fence, and they're still in the United States, mm -hmm. but there's no law officer that is going to go out there at night. I mean, they're, they're left unprotected, uh, and, and it's scary. I would like to invite her to s spend a night in, in her house right there. I, I think she'd probably bring an army with her. <laughs> <laughs> and she would have to, you know. It's amazing how when they irrigate at night, uh, it used to be that they spend, workers spend all night irrigating. They don't do that anymore. There's, okay. there's, the government has its priorities. We have to have the Catholic Church provide uh, contraception. and. And abortion. <laughs> <laughs> High on their priority. Yeah, that's right. Now tonight here in Bee County, we're having a, a Republican roundup. Now that's when right. I grew up in South Texas, there was no such thing as a Republican Party. You know, my first campaign, I worked for Hank Grover for governor down here, but there literally were no uh, Republicans anywhere. And now you have a whole activity going on here. It's, it's quite a development. Well, we've changed. Uh, Bee County's changed. When I first ran as a Republican in 1992, uh, it was myself and one other Republican official. Now we, we basically control the courthouse. We have district clerk that's Republican, tax assessor collector that's Republican, county judge that's Republican, two commissioners that are Republican, and a lot of those are Hispanics. You know, it, the word Republican used to be a four-letter word here, and, and we changed. And if you go further north, there's a lot of counties that are a lot like us, and. Uh, to a certain extent, it's, it's happening down in the valley, and I'm, I'm hoping Adela's going to break some ground down there uh, as the first Republican Hispanic female from the valley. That would be fantastic. Well, I know uh, Representative Aaron Pena did a, a great service for us in breaking some ground down there and, and uh, showing people that Republicans could represent the valley and the district down there. So I remember my first uh, my first uh, race as a supporting a, a, the first Republican county judge, and, and his last name was Garza, like I was, and, and everybody thought we were related. It was Tony Garza. Mm -hmm. uh, he later became ambassador of, uh, to Mexico, the United States. But I remember walking the streets and 
block walking for him, and, and uh, it was our first Republican county judge. And, and they have a county uh, Hispanic Republican judge now. Mm -hmm. Is that not right, Adele? Yes. And mm -hmm. you know, it's funny how it, it goes back. You know, you work really, really hard, and then it goes back. So then from Republican, it went back to, to the Democrats, and, and we had to pick up our and, and, and our speed and work again, and we it went back to another Republican uh, county judge. But it takes a lot of work, and but we're making strides, and every year, and that's why I knew that we could get Congressman Brentall elected, because I figured we didn't need to win Cameron County. We just needed to up the numbers, and we did that, uh, and, and, and it, that night was sweet. It, it, it was really sweet. You because know, something that's sad that's going on, though, and I've, this is some, it's a comment on the media, uh, I went with Adela to uh, interview in one of his films in Austin, mm -hmm. and the lead up to her to her uh, interview was how horrible Republicans were, mm -hmm. and one of his son is is routinely bashing Republicans as being anti-immigrant. Uh, what they fail to say is that Republicans are pro-immigration; they're just anti-illegal immigration, right. and, and they equate the two, and it's not to be equated. And it's frustrating when when you know part of the reason that we have this this uh, lynch mob mentality with Trayvon Martin is because uh, blacks have been told for a long time that, you know, that they are persecuted uh, and, and they, that changes their mindset to the point where they can't accept or they see the world in a different way and I think that's what's happening unfortunately to Hispanics that watch, with, watch Spanish language uh, news. And we have to, as Republicans, be very careful about that as well. We have the Republican State Convention coming up in a, a few weeks about six or eight weeks now in, in Fort Worth. And I think we're gonna have an opportunity there to reshape the language of the Republican platform to, to make it more, uh, less divisive. The, the wording in the last platform was, was extremely hostile and the Democrats and people like Univision used that against us a lot when actually people like you were working very hard to uh, establish a lot of Hispanic outreach for Republicans and, and secure those values and conservative issues that they represent. And I remember last last convention, my daughter was in the platform committee, mm -hmm. and 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 they had dissenters. But my daughter and another attorney dissented and said, "This is not what we want. This this is the, the language that that we should stay away from because it is very very." I want to say very harsh on, 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 on immigrants, and they don't differentiate really. Antagonistic. Yes, yeah. that's the word. So we're going to work on fixing that this time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we've been asking somebody to be to chair that. You know, that. But, but the problem is, is there's such a frustration with the federal government that's not doing anything right. about border security that that people feel threatened, so they respond with with their own harsh language, and that's the problem. I think if the federal government would do a, a lot to secure the border, as Adela said, then, then I think people would be more accepting of a less harsh tone. And I don't know what Representative Tanahosa's positions were on, on those issues, but no matter what his positions were, as a Democrat congressman, his first obligation is to support Nancy Pelosi and her agenda. And it's time we get a good well, Republican. That's, like that's part day. of the problem with our our counties up here in the north are so frustrated. He doesn't even vote his counties in the ballot, to be honest with you. He doesn't vote their values. Right. You know, he, the values of this district, of the Dallas district, of, of the Fajita district districts, districts are, uh, are pro-life, and he never voted pro-life, uh, and pro-business, and he never voted pro-business, which, which uh, is the way the Democrat, he vote, voted the Democrat party line which is anti uh, Adela's district and, and you know what it has been here for, for a long time, anti-South Texas. Well, thank you again for your service to Texas and to our nation, and thank you for the sacrifices that you're making. One of the things I've learned this election season is when someone declares for office, it is a tremendous personal sacrifice, and I appreciate you taking the effort to go out and do that. We'll talk some more about your campaign and, and what your views are on the issues for your district. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you.